Before we start, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray you open our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's no coincidence that we sang that first hymn. It has a fairly, fairly um, blunt uh, message to it. Most fights, I think, if you hear God's word today, you don't get what he was saying. But here's the one of the parts, the first part, it's out of 40 years of wrath. Deep, force, a deep terror. That's when they went down with a straight road. They did not want to know his way out of the problem. They didn't want to know God. After he was there to seek it, if he wanted. They saw his power, they lost their rest. Seeing God's power the river, but losing God's rest is something he can't afford to do. Some of you remember the famous words. Crisis? What crisis? That's it. Uh, but the district chair, the city council section nine. Crisis? What crisis? Well, there's a crisis today in the church. It's a crisis in each of our lives when our will is out of life. That's the stark fact. Let's not believe and see God's intention and good for mankind. And this has to be linked by one idea. It is to obey God in another way. So it says. Do we realize that the three persons of the Trinity are all involved in man's creation? The pronoun we is very important. That's it, let us create. God was the creator. He was the savior. He was the lamb slain for the foundation of the world. He's an operation. And Holy Spirit as the breath. Which means all those things. They were intimate. This corresponds to the three parts of the human body, body, soul, and spirit. <coughs> and the early church uh, it was really quite hot on that. They didn't even do God, but uh, there's a packet record. The first sermon preached was something like 1570. It took a long while in the history of the church. So, what does it mean to be made in the image? Well, we must say, how we got. But the whole thing is that we were made to respond, able to respond to God. Historical and special relationship includes the reasoning part, <coughs> the moral responsible part, and the greatest part of mankind. And of course, it's being to choose. That's the call, the one for supremacy, of course. If people ask why there's so much evil in the world, they don't want to look for any further, many. The man's free will. Think about that. People do what they want to do. Is it the most thing? Obviously, it is. What is our free will doing? The problem is that after the fall, man's spirit died. That's a relationship that's badly damaged. So that's it. You want to live there? No, by God's grace, it isn't. But it takes mankind's free will to make it possible, plus more important, much more importantly, to receive by Jesus Christ. We feel our will and our will into God and surrender to His is done for us, then we're back on track. I was in a, a long, long journey yesterday on a train back from London Bridge, and uh, we were stopped in our tracks. The civil world. On the uh, line. In a ghost line, there are no jams. It's straight ahead. The challenge that I've discovered quite in a kind of shocking thing was that do we realize how the many people who we see each day are the walking dead? They live in their spirits, they live in their not personally. And that is a shock. Shops to say, what are we doing about it? How can we share the gospel? What way can we share the gospel? What's right for us to do? What fits in with our uh, ministry of people? And one verse 27 says, I've got better position than God who created male and female, not other genders. It's an example of men and women wanting to become God and determine their own list. That is quite 
Pentateuch by saying, says that God made man out of the dust. And the same minerals that are found in man are found in the ground. Now, there are endless arguments about this. But the biblical report is that's where we came from. And the dust you want, the dust you should return. God provided everything man needed food and water. All the necessary to possess a new life. We forget all too easily that even our breath is a gift from God. We got the creation. What's the first thing that ever, that's not in the telephone to bring up the hospital? It's the patient breathing. What's this say? Is that important? And the question is how dependent are we on God? How dependent are we on our limited resources? It's a question to keep on asking. It's an ongoing question. See, God might have to be allowed on his resources alone. They're more than, more than enough. They're more than enough. And man was also trying to rule over creation, which was and is still a horse and husband. So these are the things that God wanted man to be and to do. And believe. And you'll be probably wrong. Very good. So, turning to our New Testament passage, what's the difference between two men who built houses? The one that on the sand was cheaper, more convenient, quicker to build. Life might have such a death. A quick, easy answer what it, what it is. The one that on the rock took more time and sweat, but it lasted. Are we looking for things that last? The man who built his house on the rock is described in that by a version as being sensible, prudent, practical, and wise. How we need these efforts today in all that we do. It asks the question Are we hearing and responding to disciples? Do we think about our life's purpose? We have a choice. Do we think about our life's purpose? Listen and follow, or listen and disobey. There are consequences for both options. We will listen, forget, listen, and follow. And how do we know that we are people who build the house of the rock? What will be the signs of it? Well, first of all, how we come through the storms of life will show how much we depend on God, how much we depend on our own resources. One of those says, Winds slam against the house. It's dramatic. And sometimes we feel literally like that. But the house of the rock did not fall. No matter the world, the flesh of the devil, slam against the door. Secondly, our tongues will show where, and this is in our professions, what we say about ourselves. Who we say that God says we are, and also whether we use our tongues to bless or curse people who are made in God's image. Our level of obedience shows also our level of love for God. Always will be that. The Bible says that we came from God, disobeyed God, and we are restored by God by His grace if we listen. This would be an old chorus, trust and obey. There's never been a new to the trust and obey. And that is a simple something like the Christian faith trust and obey. Both and, not one or the other. Quite briefly. We have no excuse if we ignore God's promises and warnings. They're all in the only message of the Bible. Everything we do will be judged as to whether we built our life on the rock of Jesus Christ. All the world. The only way to be sure of entering heaven is to have and to share with the person of the pleasure of Jesus Christ. And that's the prime point of every believer. And some of us have to say no and use our wills and rights in order to be on our part of God's flesh along these lines and obey. Our wills come into it. Sometimes 
spiritual aspect. We can really do things for the most part. So the prime message really is listen and obey more as his disciples. It's any sense of security for mankind. Do we say, I want such a habit? Or do we say, I long for God, therefore I will seek him always? There's a message I saw in a shop yesterday. It is it? Um, it's like you, 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 you want, you can't wait, you won't wait. That is basically a very simplistic view of life. Moses that it was, was talking to God, and God was saying, he took this one in 5, verse 28. Now, what does God say? Oh, that they had such a mind and heart in them, always reverently fear me, and to keep my commandments, so they might go well with them, and their children there. God thought he was to go his way, be our horses. We have a part to play our will. We have the will to surrender and then the wants to change. That will go read. There's a story told of a priest who saw an old man on the road crack. And he came and said, You know, young man must be very close to God. The man and I said, Yes, he's very fond. God's fondness is to multiply the mist of faith. Now, I an idea God's emotions come towards us. It's strange. He's full of emotion. The Bible says he's full of emotion. He's got anger sometimes. He's long for being. He reads for being. He's a sweat. Emotion is in God. There's no question about it at all. It's very fond. Think about that and from those words and begin. So let's see God upon our minds and bring life to what we 